Real Virginia is proudly produced by the Virginia Farm Bureau Federation. Since 1926, Farm Bureau has been working to preserve Virginia farms and our rural heritage. Visit our website at vafb.com. And welcome to Real Virginia, a show about Virginia agriculture and the people who produce all the wonderful products we enjoy, brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. Virginia oysters are legendary for their flavor and freshness. Now you can enjoy them right on the water where they are harvested. Fall is almost here and so are winter squash. And we'll learn more about Agriculture Powerhouse, Southampton County. Welcome back everyone. We're coming to you this week from Meadow Event Park in Caroline County. The annual State Fair of Virginia will be hosted here at the end of September into early October with plenty of agriculture exhibits and competitions to complement the great fair food. Seafood is also very popular at the fair. Dave Miller starts our show this week with a visit to the Virginia Oyster Trail. Oysters have been a Virginia specialty since Captain John Smith first set foot in the New World. With improvements in the Chesapeake Bay watershed in recent years, the Old Dominion is once again the East Coast's largest producer of this unique shellfish. Harvesting and serving oysters is a fascinating process with roots that go back centuries. In 2014, the Virginia Oyster Trail began featuring many of the businesses and restaurants related to the delicious Virginia oyster. The Oyster Trail was started to join together all the entities uh, across Virginia who are involved in the oyster business. And so that includes the, the government agencies who regulate it, uh, the Marine, Marine Resources Commission, the Virginia Shellfish Commission, uh, VIMS, uh, schools like ours who have oyster growing programs as part of their extensions of the classroom, um, artisans, we've also joined with wine trails. And the whole idea is to feature one of the unique offerings that Virginia provides the world, which is the oyster. Growing commercial oysters begins with oyster farmers and Virginia watermen. Some are harvested naturally, others are farm raised. Each year watermen and farmers make sure more of them are seeded and raised the next year. The Oyster Trail highlights these growers along with related restaurants, hotels, museums, events, vineyards, and festivals. It gives tourists access along the Chesapeake Bay and its tributaries. One of the great things about the Oyster Trail is it's brought a lot of awareness to the area and to the oyster business where I think a lot of people drive up and down 95 and 64 and don't know all this stuff is here. So I think it's been fantastic for that. You know, they do different events and it's not just the growers like us, it's, it's the restaurants that sell the oysters. Um, but I really think that it's made the public um, be able to see more of what we do. Some commercial fishermen still tong for wild oysters in the bay, like their grandfathers did. But a new generation of oyster lovers and growers are finding new ways to preserve this important economy and tradition. This includes students at Christ Church School in Saluda, Virginia. So we're growing oysters. We're now a certified seller. Will is a certified shellfish sanitation uh, expert with the Commonwealth of Virginia. And he's teaching the students not only science, but also about regulation, government, uh, law, community, interaction, uh, the marine biology, and commerce. So by running a farm here at the school, students not only learn about water quality and the ecological importance of the oyster, but they also get a really good sense of where food comes from and the work that goes behind food production and how it gets to from the river to the table. My favorite thing is the jobs that it creates and how healthy it makes the river. It is it benefits everyone. Um, you know, kids come down and play here. We all sail here. We play in the water. So I think it benefits everyone in the community. The Chesapeake Bay is the largest estuary in North America with a watershed reaching portions of six states. Because it's so large, there are eight distinct regions of oysters in Virginia. The Ward Oyster Company is in Region 5. 
the Middle Bay Western Shore region. You know, the farms are all over the place. So you can have a Mob Jack Bay oyster, you can have a Rappahannock oyster, you can have them from different places on the Eastern Shore. And um, we've really kind of filled in a niche and taken the pressure off the, the wild oyster. And each place has a little bit more of a distinct flavor. And I think people need to know that, you know, that we really, as growers, don't have a whole lot to do with the taste of the oyster. It's from where they come from. And you, know, you get something from Chincoteague, it's gonna be much saltier because you know, we've all had a mouthful of ocean water. It's much saltier over there. And so the different subtleties in the different areas, I think um, the trail's been good about promoting the, you know, the, the eight regions now. Wherever you travel along Virginia's Oyster Trail, you'll find good food and exciting destinations to explore. You'll find oysters cooked to perfection, and you'll enjoy shopping, beaches, boating, and plenty of sparkling open water. All thanks in part to the delicious Virginia Oyster. In Middlesex County, Virginia, this is Dave Miller. In 2017, Virginia Oysters brought in $15.9 million to growers, more than a third of the entire shellfish industry's income. Prices and demand for Virginia Oysters remain strong according to an annual industry forecast. More than 111 million oysters were planted last year, 5% more than the year before. 38.9 million oysters were sold last year, and the forecast is for 42 million oysters to be sold in 2018. The average price for a Virginia oyster, combining the wholesale and retail values, came to 41 cents last year. That's about the same price as the previous two years. Hi, today we're going to be talking about winter squash in the garden from the ground up. Please stay tuned. Farm Bureau is the insurance provider of choice for farmers, but did you know all Virginians can benefit? In fact, most of our members are not farmers. As a member, you are supporting worthy causes like local Virginia food banks and the Ag in the Classroom program. Your $40 membership will easily pay for itself with the many savings options as well. Farm Bureau is made for Virginians. To learn more about the membership advantage, go to vafb.com or visit your local Farm Bureau. The garden exhibit is always popular here at the State Fair of Virginia. And speaking of garden crops, Chris Mullins with Virginia Cooperative Extension shows us his tips for growing winter squash from the ground up. Well, hi and welcome. Today we're at the Fauquier Education Farm. We're here with Mr. Jim Hankins, the executive director here. Jim, uh, you grow a lot of produce here and you've got some really interesting things right here. What is this? Well, this is seven different varieties of winter squash. We're doing a, a field variety trial of winter squash. People get confused sometimes. Winter squash means that it is a produce that will keep until the winter. We're not growing them in the winter. You know, it's the 1st of August. These are actually ready to harvest. But these guys will keep just fine. You know, you can eat this in December with no problem at all. Okay, so it's more about the storage. It is the absolutely name. about the storage, and it's about the flavor. Oh. You know, we've got a lot of different varieties, and a, you know, a whole lot of variety in the taste and how you would cook them. I can imagine so, they all look so different. What are some of the types or varieties that you have here? These golden ones over here are spaghetti squash. The really colorful one is the carnival squash, and that's just a simple variant of the acorn squash. These guys, I really love these. This is delicata squash. You can eat the skins, eat the whole thing. Um, so normally you wouldn't eat the, the skin. It would be a hard, more of a hard rind. Yeah, with the butternuts or the acorn squash, which people will be more familiar with, you know, you cut it in half, you take the seeds out, bake it, and you eat the flesh on the inside, but you're not eating the skins. Okay. You would cook the delicatas the same way, but you can eat the skin and all. Um, this is a Kushaw squash. Um, there's a lot you can do with the Kushaw. Um, this is called a long neck pumpkin. It's basically a variation on the butternut. Um, if you have bought canned pumpkin pie filling, it was probably long neck pumpkin that was, you know, I love to cut this into little half inch thick slabs, cook, bake it on a, a cookie sheet, and they're really delicious. 
Wow, that is great. Such a variety. Let's look at some of the plants and maybe you can talk a little bit about how you how you grow these. Well, Jim, we're in Northern Virginia and we're a little past midsummer. Yep. When did you actually plant them? These went in as six week, six week old transplants in late May. Um, you know, and it is time now to harvest. Winter squash like it to be fairly warm. It's not early May, it's late May. Um, they're big sprawling plants, as you can tell. You know, you've got to have some kind of mulch underneath it. I really love the reusable landscape fabric. You could use, you know, a thick hay mulch, something, but, you know, some of these vines can be 20 feet long. That is great. How would somebody know when they're kind of ready? I know there's lots of different varieties. Does it depend on any timing or anything like that? You want the vine to start to die back. You know, you want that because this is a squash that is going to be stored for months, you want it to get that really rich brown color or a tan, basically. Okay. You know, butternut shouldn't still be green, shouldn't still have streaks in it. It'll be an overall brown color. Um, and then it will store a whole lot better. Okay, so just store it in uh, maybe some dry conditions. Uh. You want to keep it out of direct sunlight, cool, dry. Don't put them in your refrigerator. They'll just mold in your refrigerator in a cabinet, you know, um, out of the direct sunlight and out of excessive heat, and they'll keep for months. Well, great. Thank you so much for letting us come out and see this operation day. We really appreciate it. Always glad to have you. Well, for more information about winter squash production, please contact your local county extension office and talk to a master gardener. For From the Ground Up, I'm Chris Mullins, and we'll see you next time. From the Ground Up is presented with the generous advice and assistance of Virginia Cooperative Extension. Visit their website at ext.vt.edu. Oysters are a long-standing Virginia delicacy. Chef John Maxwell says if you've never cooked them before, don't be intimidated. He has an easy oyster recipe that's next in the heart of the home. The State Fair of Virginia is known for its family-friendly atmosphere, exciting attractions, and of course, fabulous fair food. The most important focus continues to be youth and adult livestock competitions and dozens of competitions where other Virginians can win a coveted State Fair Blue Ribbon. Everything from prize vegetables to baked goods to crafts and photography are featured each year as the best of the best. The 2018 State Fair of Virginia runs September 28th to October 7th at Meadow Event Park in Caroline County. Visit statefairva.org to learn more. There'll be lots of seafood vendors here at the State Fair, in fact, right behind me at the Midway. And Virginia seafood is known worldwide. Today, Chef John Maxwell shows us his recipe for basic oysters in the heart of the home. Hi, welcome to the heart of the home. I'm Chef John Maxwell and we're here in Meadow Hall at Meadow Event Park in Doswell, Virginia. And we're getting ready to play with some great Virginia food. We do this every week. This week is a special though. We're gonna be playing with some oysters out of the Chesapeake Bay. We're making a dish that relies very heavily on the quality of the oysters from the, that you use. All right, the first thing we wanna do is we wanna get this pot started to get any hot. Right. And I'm going to put some butter in the bottom of that pot. Right. While that's melting, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about these oysters. These, these came from the Pianca Tank, which is a river that feeds into the Chesapeake Bay. These came from my brother's oyster um, operation. He doesn't have a commercial operation. He has a few tailor floats out by his house, and uh, he grows his own oysters. So this is uh, what a Chesapeake oyster looks like if you let it go and let it just keep on growing. It's all rough and craggy. It's got muscles growing on it. It's got barnacles, it's got all kinds of stuff growing on it. They're ugly on the outside and just gorgeous on the inside. So this is melted, it's getting ready to go. I'm gonna take my oysters. And I'm not gonna make a full batch. You can get the recipe for a full batch off the website, but I'm just gonna saute off these oysters. Aren't these gorgeous oysters? This oyster stew's gonna need a knife and fork. Right, so we got that in there, stir that around a little bit. All I want to do with this is, is get the oysters to curl around the edges, just to begin to cook. I don't want them to actually overcook, and it's why we're doing the oysters first. Right, now I'm going to take this around. I'm going to transfer the oysters 
into this. So now I've got butter that we've used to cook the oysters. I'm going to add some celery. All right, and some shallots. And let that saute off a little bit. Just want the vegetables to soften. I don't want them to brown. You don't want anything to brown here. All right. As they begin to soften, they'll release some of the liquid. And that way the flavor of the celery, the flavor of the shallots will go through the whole soup. Now we're going to add some oyster liqueur. This is the what you drain off. It's in the shell, but you don't necessarily slurp it down. I'm putting some oyster liqueur in here. And it's going to give it a great flavor. Now I'm going to add some milk. And the recipe is on the website, so you can get the exact amount for the amount that you want. Milk's going in there. And now some heavy cream, good local Virginia heavy cream. Now, now we're going to let this come to a boil. And it's going to take a couple of minutes. So we're going to add the oysters back in. You can see this is beginning to boil. And one of the things to watch out for with the oyster stew is that if you boil it too long or too hard, um, the oyster liqueur that's in here will cause the cream and the milk to curdle a little bit, and you don't want to do that. So we've got that there. I'm going to cut the heat down, right? And I'm going to add these oysters back in, and now we're going to simmer it for about a minute, minute and a half. All right, now that's a very basic, straightforward oyster stew. Very tasty, rich in, in, in oyster flavor. But a lot of people like to spice theirs up a little bit, and you could do that with Tabasco sauce or with Worcestershire sauce. But be careful with them. Oyster stew is really good on its own. This is best if you heat the bowl. You don't have to heat the bowl, of course, but it's best if you heat the bowl. Now we're going to add the oysters to the bowl. Typically you would do this because you'd cook the whole batch of, of oyster stew for everybody and you want to make sure everybody gets the right amount of oysters. Uh, otherwise you have to disarm your guests, take knives away and forks away because they'll fight. I'll take a ladle. Add this here. Here we've got oyster stew, Virginia style. All right. And we've got a little bit of crackers. They are called, oddly enough, oyster crackers. So we'll add a few of those to it as well. Have a good time. It's Chesapeake Bay. So join us next week on Heart of the Home, where we get to play with great Virginia food. Recipes from the heart of the home can be found on the Virginia Farm Bureau website at VAFB.com, as well as on Chef Maxwell's website at ChefJohnMaxwell.com. Harvesting from Virginia's public oyster beds took off after the end of the Civil War when New England oyster supplies were depleted from overfishing. Over the past 15 years, new disease-resistant oyster varieties and a huge burst of farm-raised oysters have led to a boom era for the tasty Virginia oyster. The Virginia Oyster Trail highlights eight specific flavors for oysters based on the salinity of the water and other local factors. They include the seaside, Upper Bay Eastern Shore, Lower Bay Eastern Shore, Upper Bay Western Shore, Middle Bay Western Shore, Lower Bay Western Shore, Tidewater, and the Tangier, middle of the Chesapeake Bay regions. Agriculture exhibits from many different communities will be featured here during the State Fair of Virginia that opens on September 28th. And this month, we highlight Agriculture Powerhouse Southampton County. It's one of the state's largest agriculture communities. Located on Virginia's southern border just west of Hampton Roads is Southampton County. 
The population is a little over 18,000 and the county seat is Cortland. Because it's so close to one of the first English settlements in colonial America, farmers began working the land in 1634. By 1749, Southampton County was established, and as it grew, so did the business of farming. If I had a term, I guess I'd say that Southampton County is the, is the workhorse or the draft horse of, of the agricultural um, uh, drivers in the state. Uh, it's usually in one of the top ten, depending on which metric you use to measure, but in dollars, usually around in the top 10. There are 335 farms in Southampton County covering more than 153,000 acres and generating $79.4 million in farm income each year. Cotton is still king as the top field crop, followed by soybeans. Crops make up 85 percent of the farm economy in the area and livestock sales account for 15 percent. M.L. Everett is a fourth-generation farmer in Southampton County. His family has raised cotton, peanuts, small grains, and some livestock. Everett says that while cotton is doing well today and is the county's largest crop, it has had its ups and downs. Cotton has had a real, real surge from uh, the late 50s when my dad was growing cotton and the boll weevil put the farmers at that time out of the cotton business. Um, because of programs that we've implemented to try to control the boll weevil and, and stay on top of it to not let it re-enter into our cotton production area, we've gone back to producing cotton. Southampton County soil is sandy and the days are dry and warm, making it excellent cropland for cotton as well as the famous Virginia peanut and fresh produce. The advantage of having a soil that will dry quickly is it reduces the disease component. So in um, crops like your peanuts and your melon crops that disease is such a, um, a terrible thing, you know, for the crop. Neil Drake has owned Grayson and Emma's Garden Spot, a local farmer's market in the county, for 19 years. A produce grower himself, he said more people are looking for fresh, locally sourced food, and Southampton County farmers can easily provide that. I think farmers have diversified a little. It is, uh, you've got several that raise sweet corn. Um, a lot of retired farmers also raise a lot of produce and I get, I get produce from those guys. Um, uh, pro, uh, watermelons obviously a pretty big, big crop here. We buy most of our watermelons in. Pumpkins that's coming up here pretty soon and sweet potatoes, we'll buy some of those locally as well. But it isn't just local produce that is making a profit for Southampton County growers. Agricultural products are aggressively being marketed outside the border of Virginia and on world markets. A lot of your foreign countries now are spinning uh, yarn. Uh, they're making garments. Garments are being shipped back into the U.S. Uh, so we're exporting to those countries. They cannot grow their own cotton, but they're taking the yarn and producing the, the garments for us to, to buy back. There's a little added advantage where we are because we're only about an hour um, west of the Port of Virginia. So. Uh, the, the export now has become a part, of, a part of agricultural business as much as anything else. With 93 century farms that have been in the same family for more than 100 years, Southampton County is proud of its rich agricultural heritage. That's the largest number of historic family farms in the Old Dominion and stands as proof that agriculture continues to be the root of this community. Be sure to join us September 28th through October 7th. And that's going to do it for this edition of Real Virginia. We are so glad you could join us to celebrate the bounty Virginia has to offer. Whether it's in your home, your garden, or here at the State Fair, we are proud to say that this is Real Virginia. So for everyone from the Virginia Farm Bureau, thanks for watching. Make it a good week. Chesapeake Bay